And we thought we'd um, think about ag tech and, and what uh, technologies are in there and how they might apply to some other areas. And the obvious one that's all on our doorsteps for the most unfortunate reasons is in uh, emergency recovery with the uh, fires that we've had, not just in Kangaroo Island, but particularly there. So we thought we'd uh, have a little discussion and ask uh, your inputs for that or, or indeed other applications because there are a lot of applications of the ag tech te technologies across, uh, some of them come from the, the space uh, area for example, and crossing over into the health and medical uh, area. So uh, really open in any area but we'll focus particularly on emergency uh, recovery. So our first panel member, if I could welcome him to the stage, is Jason Chif uh, Chaffee, CEO of Agassons and E Shepherd. Uh, with the virtual fencing and those of you who were there today. It was a very, uh, very interesting presentation. Jason is originally from rural New South Wales. He co-founded the uh, Ageson in 2014 and was the Chief Operating Officer before coming CEO in 2019. And he's overseen the development and trial program of the East Shepherd product. He's passionate about bringing positive change to the agricultural industry via a digital paddock technology. Welcome, Jason. Our second panel <coughs> member is Hugo Lemesurer. Hi, Hugo, who's a strategic advisor from Fire SA. But uh, Hugo is uh, um, all around the traps in innovation in Adelaide. I've worked with Hugo in many, many ways. He has over 25 years' experience in startup, listed, and multinational organisations in the USA, Europe, uh, and Australia. And he specialises in developing and investing in high growth businesses and teams. And being from Fire SA, he's going to particularly focus on how we might protect uh, buildings and people uh, from the ravages uh, of fire. And next is Andy Coronius, who is the CEO of the recently established SmartSat CRC, building on our you know, really magnificent strength in the space uh, area here. Uh, many of you will know the Cooperative Research Centre program. Um, but it's a consortium that brings together industry and research organisations. Uh, in his case, I think almost 100 members. I don't envy you that one, Andy. Um, and, but the CRC is developing game-changing satellite technologies that will catapult us into the, the global space economy. And finally, uh, Dr Mark Rice. He's a co-founder from Safety From Space. Uh, safety From Space is working on a new safety system for locations too far from uh, wireless uh, coverage. Mark is an electronic engineer with 25 years experience in senior leadership, technical and business role, uh, roles. Please join me in making them feel welcome. So just to start with, as a further introduction, I've introduced the individuals, but I'd like to have each panel member say a little bit about their organisations uh, and the focus. We'll start with you, Mark. Oh, uh, do we have a... Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank, <coughs> thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, I'll just say a little bit about safety from space. Uh, it was started in 2018, and uh, the idea is to provide emergency connectivity and management solutions for people in remote locations using next generation satellite based technologies. The business was supported by UniSA, uh, Innovation and Collaboration Center. I've got the t-shirt on. <laughs> and uh, uh, many thanks to, uh, to uh, all the support they gave me in, in many different ways. Um, and uh, I've been working very closely with the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, which is responsible for search and rescue in Australia, and various other uh, Australian emergency responders who are helping me with defining uh, future systems. Um, so that also includes airborne and, and even spaceborne systems, and in particular, we've uh, got interest from NASA, which is, uh, which is good. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Andy. Thank you, Liana, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you. I start by saying that um, there are some 50 countries that have satellites that whiz uh, over our uh, country on a daily basis, multiple times a day. 50 countries can actually see what happens in your backyard, but we don't have any. Um, and yes, we were told before in the previous panel and before that 
uh, the, the price of uh, satellite images is coming down, but it's other people's satellite images, and they can increase the price, or they can even stop uh, having those um, uh, made available to us. And we feel that that is something that it's really un-Australian, because we lead in so many areas, and yet we're not leading in satellite technologies. So we thought here in South Australia we'll change that, and we built a consortium of industry, universities, and government, as Liana said, more than 100 partners. We raised $245 million in R&D, and $55 million were, was given by our federal government, and my thanks also goes to our state government for their support uh, in the CRC. And we've built a, a, an R&D organization that will actually build Australia's capability in three areas. First of all, in advanced communications, and we do need it, connectivity, the stuff that Mirota is doing, and so on, uh, but also in greater capability and analytics in earth observation and remote sensing. And thirdly, and possibly more importantly, is to make satellites smarter, and that's why we call it the SmartSat CRC, to actually put AI algorithms, machine learning, deep learning algorithms, on the platform itself. The farmers are not interested in data. The farmers are interested in what was said before, actionable information or, or prescriptions on how to do things. And that's what the next generation of satellites will do. They will image the Earth, but also give you the information that you need. So we are excited about building those new technologies for Australia, building new jobs or building an industry, but more importantly also transforming mining, agriculture, defence, transport and logistics and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Hugo. Thanks, Sienna. Um, I thought I'd start with a story. Uh, I'm from Fire SA and we have a product over there called FireGuard. Uh, but this is sort of a personal thing for me. I remember when I was a kid, I was 14 years old and I looked up at the Adelaide Hills and I watched the fire front coming in from Ash Wednesday. And I was wondering whether I was going to have to evacuate. I was in the city, three k's away from it. I'll never forget it. Um, what I didn't know was at the same time, about 500 k's away, 400, uh, my future wife was hiding in a lake underneath a hessian sack, underneath an upturned boat, and uh, a fireball was coming over their property. And I remember my father-in-law saying it was as high as the gum trees and it was coming right over them and they were sitting in front of the house. Uh, and the fire front went right over them and the air was sucked out and the heat was there and the smoke was there. Afterwards, they, they came out of the lake and they had four other kids from the local school there whose parents hadn't been able to get them. Everyone was safe. It was fantastic. Not so good for others in the area. But what happened was the fire had missed their house. It had come right up to it and then gone across and it took out all the outbuildings. Everything was on fire. Um, so the kids went into the house and they sat there and the parents went out and started fighting the fire. The kids came running out about an hour and a half later saying the house is on fire, the house is on fire. And what had happened is embers had got in underneath the house, they'd started a fire. So they spent the next two hours trying to put the fire out. And at the end of that, all of the outhouses were gone, all the other buildings were gone, they'd lost everything and they spent the next two days uh, trying to look after the animals or, or, or looking after what was left of the farm. And I guess the long and the short of that is that even now, uh, 25 years later, my wife still struggles to light a barbecue because uh, she's still affected by the fire. So for me, it's all about how do we save people? How do we allow them to make different decisions? And so um, luckily I met Graham, who's up the back there, and about five years ago we, he was talking about this system that would turn on, a sprinkler system that would automate it. And so today we're sort of unveiling for the first time the fire guard system. And what I might do is just ask if we could put the video on. I've got a little 30 second video because it says much better than I can how the system works. Thanks, Hugo. It's a 
Yeah, quite an impressive story. I can remember that fire. Yeah, yeah. Sure. It was it's really scary stuff seeing the lofty on, on fire. Yeah. Mm. So the beauty of our bush anyway, it does tend to come back. I can remember running up. We had this horrible run. I used to do Torture Ridge where you'd run from uh, the city up to Mount Lofty. Um, and uh, it was just black and bare. But, you know, a few years later, it was all green again. So uh, it's the beauty of our own climate, I guess. So, um, Jason. Yeah. Thanks, Lena. Uh, Adjacence uh, was founded in 2014 with the uh, purpose in mind of automating the movement of livestock. And uh, since that time, uh, we've raised over $25 million in capital, uh, all private. And uh, today we're about 45 people and looking to commercialise our technology and uh, begin sales later this year in Queensland. The product itself is, uh, consists of a neck band that uh, sits on the ridge of the uh, livestock. We focus today on beef cattle only and uh, that uh, animal is able to be trained through our uh, training protocol and from then you can then create as many fences as you like and maintain a fence around the, the mob. The primary advantages of using this, of course, is around past utilisation, rotational grazing, and increasing the long-term value of your property. And so uh, with that, uh, we, we uh, plan to then uh, commercialise later this year. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Jason. Now, I'd like to ask a question around... I'm going to centre it around the Kangaroo Island fires because it's so real to us. Um, and to start with Mark and Andy, and I'd like you to say what could have been different um, if we had uh, activated some of the technologies that you have or will have in future, it doesn't necessarily have to be here right now, what might have happened in the early stages of those fires that we could have controlled them without them becoming the disaster that they were? Thank you. Um, well, I think on many... On many levels, things could have been done better with better technology. Uh, at the moment, we do have, uh, and we're very, very lucky and very grateful to the Japanese uh, for using the weather satellite, in fact, the satellite that we use for our weather, the Himawari 8, uh, to give us um, images of the fire front. Um, I think it's every 10 minutes. In fact, they actually increase that temporal resolution just for us. But of course, the resolution of that, because it is so far high up, uh, because it's a geostationary satellite, the resolution of that is a couple of kilometers. So therefore, by the time that the fire builds to two kilometers wide, uh, so that the satellite can detect it, is far too late. Uh, there are the LEOs, the low Earth orbiting satellites, uh, like the Sentinel and others that we use, uh, but again, uh, they have a resolution of about 60 meters, but they uh, pass over every 12 hours. So in terms of detection, we could have done a lot better by having our own constellation of satellites that are tasked and controlled to be able to detect the fire much, much sooner. Now, this is a longer-term strategy. In the shorter term, what we could have done is actually use some very clever algorithms to be able to bring together many satellites, uh, the data of many satellites, and fuse it together, together with some in situ technologies. At the moment, the, the infrared cameras and the cameras and the stuff that you actually just showed, but on a larger scale, could have given us detection of the fires much, much earlier than we could have otherwise had, or like we had at the moment. And that's where the technology is likely to go, with IoT devices becoming so inexpensive, it would be much easier for us to actually have that detection of fusing the data from satellites and validating it within situ uh, sensors. So that's in the detection, but also in the response, communications and situational awareness are critical. The fire crew needs to know what is happening. The fire crew needs to know where the firefighters are, and in fact, all the emergency workers and humans, and in fact, even livestock. But they need to know exactly what is happening in, in the situation room when they are fighting the fire. They need to have advanced information of how the fire front is moving and toward, toward a particular direction. 
And all of that technology with communications and IoT, and particularly with the automatic identification systems, the work that Mark is doing actually, uh, will, allow, will enable us in the future to do a far better uh, detection, response, and indeed recovery as well. Thanks, Andy. Mark. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. I totally agree with, with all of that. I think just to add a bit more to that, it's um, uh, the, 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 we, we have a lot of great technologies which can be brought to bear, like the detection, it's combining those and uh, providing the information in a timely manner to the right people. So it, it's doing, doing the, gathering up the data, uh, being able to analyze it in real time and, um, and, and trying to take, um, well, someone said before, taking the humans out of the loop to some extent in terms of automating some of these processes so that um, the right people can, can get that information quickly. Um, I think there's, there's a, a key point in this type of situation is um, providing uh, highly re reliable and resilient uh, connectivity so that uh, you know, the, the problem with, uh, with a bushfire is the intensity is, is such that it will take out a lot of infrastructure. So you, you just can't rely on anything. So uh, satellite is going to survive that kind of situation. It, it will be there. And uh, you know, the, there are ways to use it in combination with the existing infrastructure, but you've got to have something as a fallback. Uh, at the moment, the systems are pretty basic. And uh, what we really want is to be able to um, uh, allow teams to work as, you know, as a team, coordinate between them have that information about where the other members are so that it can be distributed and, and uh, they can see where the, where the bodies are in, in a critical situation and, and take action. Thanks, Mark. I did read an article recently that said, claimed that we have the technology now to detect fires very early. So drones, for example, could be detecting smouldering early f uh, fires, which then if you had the response systems in place, you could zap in with uh, chemicals or whatever. Uh, so that we'd never get to that point. Do you agree with that, or, or have we got a way to go with the technology? Me? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Yes, I agree that a lot of the technology is available. Uh, and I think it's not that it should be one solution or another. The beauty and the challenge is to actually integrate those solutions, yeah. to integrate satellite-based uh, space-borne assets with airborne as well as drones and, and, in fact, in situ. And at the moment, we don't have that capability of that integration of the data in a way that provides us advanced warning. You can't just have drones up there just in case. You want to have drones as the first, uh, uh, I guess, alert once you have already detected something to go and investigate further rather than getting your whole crew to, to go and uh, fight a fire that was actually an error because it was a cloud or something. Thank you. And Hugo. Um, in terms of what could have happened in protection of buildings with fire systems such as you have, I had the benefit, I guess, of, while it existed of being down at Southern Ocean Lodge. I had a half price special, <laughs> so I went down there. A magnificent facility, they, and they did show me their sprinkler systems, which were looked to me very impressive, but obviously with the strength of fire, it didn't work. Um, do we have systems coming up that could uh, prevent that kind of uh, uh, damage in that extreme situation? I guess when you have uh, a, a big enough fire, there's not a lot you can do. The more water you throw at it, the more energy it needs to put in to burn something. So the more water you have, the safer you'll be. You either take out the oxygen, you take out the fuel, or you use water to remove the energy. So they're the things you can do. I guess where we see the sort of systems that, that we've, we're developing, it was Graham was, he's a CFS fighter, fire, firefighter for the last 30 years. Um, he was seeing that the people in his CFS unit were losing their homes. The CFS will go out, they'll fight the fire. That's the last thing they do. They'll protect property. That's the second thing they do. First thing they do is save life. So if we can find ways to make it so that your property is safer and that people are maybe not actually out there trying to put out the property fire necessarily, uh, but they might be out there trying to fight the fire, then perhaps we won't have such big fires. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for, from my family's experience, the CFS never made it to their farm. 
that was just not the way it went. There were too many other things going on. So, um, I mean, ultimately, I think technologies like this, though, and you, and you alluded to it as well, if we have a network of enough of these uh, systems set up, we'll be able to pick up the fire as the fire is coming in. You'll be able to then take that information, as long as the networks are still available, and be able to put that back up into the CFS systems and say, actually, in fact, guys, we've got embers coming down over here, here, and here. You may not know it. They can fly 5, 10 k's ahead. Now we can say where the fire fronts might be starting as the systems activate. Thanks, Hugo. Now, now Jason, uh, yep. virtual fencing. Um, it's not approved yet in South Australia, but let's, uh, let's assume it was. Uh, would, what would have happened in that fire to, to the livestock um, versus the fencing systems we currently have? And um, if, would it be cost effective here and now for farmers to, in rebuilding, because there's a lot of rebuilding offences going on, to be using virtual instead of uh, uh, real fences? So I get the hard question? You get the hard question. <laughs> Uh, well, I think there's a, there's a couple of things, and I think um, it's important to that we shouldn't. While there, there's many, um, there was a few uh, people who did uh, lose their lives. There was also countless uh, animals that also lost their lives, and um, this is the livelihood of many farmers. It's the the way that they put bread on the table and their school, kids to school and everything else. And it's not only that, but it's just the 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 inhumane way in which they they die. Virtual fencing, uh, like all technologies that have been described here today, I think has a place in uh, preventing uh, in terms of the rescue, the recovery, and, um, and how that goes about can be a, a variety of ways. I see that virtual fencing, because with our technology, you know where the animals are at any point in time. So if there is an alert or a, an understanding of where the fire front is, then you're able to then place a virtual fence and move those animals. And uh, you're able to move them uh, to a certain part of the, the paddock. They've already been trained, they understand the response. And so in terms of the, the fire and once that starts, then you, you have that sense of knowing it. The other aspect is also the animal welfare agencies, the, the people who uh, do the rescue and recovery, the RSPCA, they could then get access to that data to know where the animals are as well. And while the human rescue side is going, the animal rescue side could, could also uh, happen as well. Um, in terms of fencing, the, uh, I do see the virtual fencing because there's an infinite number of ways of uh, putting a fence on a property that it is a cost effective uh, way of, of doing it. However, there's always a place for a physical fence. And I think as the property scales up, the, the cost benefit uh, in, is, is there, particularly for much larger farms. And if they have a concentration of a lot of subdivisions within their farm, then that is also, uh, for the e-shepherd, it's also a very cost effective way of doing that. So after a, a, um, a, the fence is being destroyed, certainly a boundary fence would still need to be in place because of uh, your neighbour and, 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 and keeping that control. But the internal You could fencing. always put a collar on your neighbour. Yes, <laughs> that's right. It's usually uh, partners that they want to put their uh, <laughs> collar on. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, but then in the, the recovery is also just knowing where the animals are. So after a fire event, um, in the event that a, a, a front, a fire front is coming, the fence can be deactivated so the animals are not being trapped. And if they do run and escape and go somewhere, then you can then find your animals afterwards, um, either uh, and uh, to bring, the, bring them back. So I think virtual fencing combined with the, the fact that we also know where the animals are and where they're moving can be an effective tool for, for helping in that rescue and recovery. Thank you, Jason. You handled the hard question well. Uh, we just have time for a couple of quick questions. If anyone has any, please, in the, in the middle there. Um, Andrew Coppin from FarmBot, thanks for your um, insights. Again, whilst our primary um, interest is uh, managing farm water and IoT, uh, to the extent that ag tech can assist in emergency recovery since the fires, um, given we monitor thousands of water tanks, uh, we have been approached by the Bushfire Brigade who want to be able to pinpoint uh, tanks 
and know in real time um, how much water, the exact location and what fittings are on the tank so that the um, fire brigade can access it quickly. Um, in our research with our farming clients, we found out that sort of 70% of them were in the bushfire brigade anyway. <laughs> Um, so the prospects of them sharing their water insights with the fire brigade didn't present any major issues. Um, and in, in, in Victoria, it actually has an additional benefit, and I think this will end up being a national standard. I'm not sure about the rules here, but, you know, if the fire brigade take your water um, in, to defend your house or other property and then they have a requirement to return it, um, the benefit of knowing with our device how much water was taken is they know exactly how much to return. So we've sort of walked into a win-win-win scenario uh, in the scheme of um, fire management um, by monitoring water in real time. And again, we use satellite for 80% of what we do. So more a comment to add to the discussion about how ag tech can help um, in this. And, Obviously, we're doing all we can to work with the fire brigades to, to, and farmers to provide that access. So I do think there are really opportunities here for those of us in the remote sensing um, and ag tech businesses to, um, to consider such solutions as sidelines to our core business. That's a fantastic, you know, pragmatic uh, uh, opportunity. Any one more quick question? No? Oh, oh sorry, down the front. Emma. Uh, so the uh, question that Emma uh, asked is why uh, are we not able to commercially operate in South Australia with our technology? Uh, there's uh, regulations in South Australia that prevent the sale and use of collars uh, that uh, provide electrical stimulus to animals other than cats and dogs. And so we're sort of tied up and stuck between that uh, legislation. So that's what prevents it. Um, Queensland and Tasmania are the only states that we can operate. <laughs> yes, and uh, the pulse isn't as much as an electric fence either, so, and then they eventually um, respond to just an audio cue, so in terms of the animal benefits, it's a lot, it's a lot better. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Emma. Well, thank you very much for that session, and please join me in thanking uh, the panel members. Thank you very much for your time and insights.